I'm an animal person. I appreciate the beauty of them. I don't know. I was just a, an animal lover when I was a kid. Dogs and cats and snakes and lizards and whatever I could find. It started when my dad went deer hunting. And shot this deer. And he said, you know, when I shot the deer, he says, the, the deer wasn't quite dead. And it, it looked up at his head and looked at me. And he said, it was almost like saying, why did you shoot me? He was intelligent in a very natural way. And he said, I just never could do it after that. And then you realize we were put on here for something. And the best thing we could do is manage what we have and the beautiful things we have. And animals fit right into that category. Mustang horses are going to become extinct if we don't save them. And uh, so I just sort of house them. to uh, live out their existence. I just like to see everything, everything live. I like uh, living things. Orangutans mean the people of the forest. They are the best farmers because they eat a lot of fruits and they disperse seeds that will keep planting trees. In 1998, I encountered with orangutan that you know came and approached me about 10 meters. And I had like eye contact for such a long time, maybe 10 minutes. I feel like she delivered a message that please help. In 1998, it's actually the start of the booming of palm oil in Sumatra. When palm oil is cultivated by destroying rainforests, home of many, many wildlife, including orangutans, that means that this farm oil is actually destructive and unsustainable. They come in and bulldoze everything. The topsoil's gone, the ground water table changes. The orangutans can die straight right now. In the United States, you, know, you look at from the back of any product and about 50% of the products contain palm oil. One hectare of uh, palm oil plantation can produce three tons of oil a month. This attract made industry to use palm oil because it's cheap. And it's anywhere you know, from shampoos, to lotion, to cookies. But it's not cheap. In order to produce palm oil, you actually sacrifice a lot of wildlife, including orangutans. Do you think that that female orangutan that uh, approached you, do you think that she knew that you were one, gonna be the one? I'm chosen by orangutans <laughs> to help them. I'm founder and director of Orangutan Information Center, a local NGO based in Sumatra to save orangutans and deer rainforest homes. The palm oil plantation workers uh, call us for help when they see orangutans. So uh, it is very important to respond to the report very quickly. 
Saving Orangutan actually saving the forest. And saving the forest means actually saving the people and our future. All right, so we just arrived at the Orangutan Information Center, and Welcome, Paul, um, thanks for having us. Um, and uh, Paul, of course, you know, organizing this whole uh, adventure. And uh, so, so tell me, what are you guys? You're about to go out on a orangutan rescue. It used to be an orangutan habitat, okay. but then converted to become palm oil plantations. And that's why some of the orangutans still live there and being isolated from their own habitat. And that's why we need to rescue them. So it was just here in 2012, I was invited to come and document the palm oil expansion and the forest destruction. And also the wildlife trade and what was going on. Yeah, I remember just photographing the orangutan rescue. And he just made eye contact with me and that was it. I just, you know, the world needed to know about this issue. And, and that was it, I've been coming back ever since. So you're rescuing the orangutan and then now where are you gonna translocate them? If they're in a good uh, condition, we're going to release them at the same day. But if they're in the, you know, like, uh, in the condition that need medical services. So we work together with SO Safety Quarantine Center and we're going to send them uh, to be rehabilitated before they're going to be released one day when they're ready. Wow, all right. Well, I know you guys have to get going. Thank you for your amazing work. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Good luck, yeah? Thank you. We'll hopefully see you yeah. in the next day or yeah. so, yeah? We'll be catching up with you soon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Community right. and plantation workers shoot the orangutans initially and if that doesn't work, then, sadly, then they're calling um, OIC or SOCP to extract these orangutans. So um, you can imagine there's a lot of wild orangutans out there with bullet wounds. It's incredibly sad that this even has to take place. Rescuing an orangutan from where it sh you know, should be its home to translocate it to a place like the lesser ecosystem where it's going to be protected. They are trapped here and they use uh, this, you know, plantation trees as the uh, fallback food, rubber. Sometimes when they have to, around then just try to adapt to survive. How long does it usually take for the dart to take effect? Depends, because sometimes the adrenaline can make it really fast. <laughs> or usually less than 15 minutes. You can see that the dart is start to be reacted because the movement right now is slowing down. Pregnant. She's pregnant? Yeah. Is this going to affect the baby? No. And, and we found an air rifle bullet on the body. That means she's actually shot by people. She was shot by people? Yeah. Oh no. Can yeah. you take the bullet out? Uh, Are you removing it? It's already uh, planted inside. That happened oh, oh. a lot when, when around that in the fantasy landscape. Yeah. Uh, people sometimes just try to scare away. Yeah. No. Oh. But also sometimes people you know, become oh. opportunistic poacher. No, no. Yeah. They see orangutan. Probably she was with the baby. Yeah. Previously, okay. maybe she was with the baby that had been taken by poacher. Who knows? I hope not. Oh, Denise, this is another image, a tool to influence consumers, influence people, and how, you know, how we interact with the planet. And, times like this that uh, strong imagery can really influence people's choices and I think that's what's important here right now to show them what's going on the reason to talk about why it's going on and hopefully uh, things can change in the future they will go extinct so there's not enough so we really need to build these corridors secure land and build corridors between them so the orangutans can move When they first arrive, every orangutan is given a, a full medical checkup. So 
So they get the chest x-rays to check for TBC. They get blood samples taken and tested for things like hepatitis, herpes virus, and that kind of stuff. They get full check over. When an orangutan has been through its quarantine and done all its medical checks and pronounced fit and healthy, then it'll be brought here. So usually we don't just open the door and throw them in. We put them in the shut off case so they can see each other for a couple of days. And then gradually introduced to a group. Of that uh, on the left here is Chris Mon. He was in a cage that was barely bigger than his shoulder width, you know? I think I have a picture somewhere. He came out of it a couple of years ago. He could barely stand, he barely had the use of his legs. We actually trained him so that we could move him around to get his food, so we got him climbing. Can these people be prosecuted for keeping a wild orangutan? That particular case? In theory, yes, but there's never been a case. By a long way, you find a lot more illegal pet orangutans being kept in areas where the palm oil concessions are actively clearing forest. I see. Okay. So there is a strong connection there. In front of you now, a low, sir. He was shot 62 times with an air rifle. He's totally blind. Still got two pellets in one eye, one in the other. Yeah. We took the pellets out that we could palpate through the skin, but he's still got 48 pellets inside him. But he's doing very well. He's uh, fit and strong, but totally blind. There'll never be a wild orangutan again. At a place called Orangutan Haven, we're building these nice islands surrounded by water where there'll be trees and ropes and long grass and bamboo. And He's one of the candidates to go over there. You know, after many, many years, I still get a massive thrill just seeing some of the orangutans we've released in the forest behaving like wild orangutans are looking down at me and they couldn't care less if I'm there or not. Yeah. You know, that's the goal. When did the tourism um, really start happening here? Well, it started happening uh, after the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. I always say, if you want to help the great apes, the first thing that you can do is go to the habitat countries. Vote with your dollars, vote with your feet. Mm -hmm. And because if you go there, you tell the people, the local people, the national governments of those countries, that you consider the great apes important. Come to see the orangutans. And that's my message. An orangutan used to be able to go from here, you know, 100 miles into the mountains, into the foothills, and then, you know, 10 years later, come back, as mm -hmm. the males do roam. Mm -hmm. Now, he can't mm -hmm. get back. Can't. And the reason he can't get back is because he has to go through a hundred miles of palm oil. Kind of explain to me the OFI nursery and what you guys do here. So pretty much the OFI nursery is where we receive the uh, orangutan orphans. We usually get them from the forestry police or, for, or locals as well. And most of these orangutans are orphans because they have killed their mothers and they've left the babies either be kept as pets mm -hmm. or to be sold as, as pets. Okay. Yeah, we care for them, and then we'll hopefully one day they'll be back in the wild. I think it's really important for these NGOs to really work with the community and the plantation owners to really bring them up to speed on the conservation and the value of these, these species. It's a huge asset for Indonesia and the planet. Let's hope they realize that before it's all gone. The sad truth is, much of the world does not share my belief that all sentient beings have just as much a right to be a part of this planet. And when you look at those animals and you interact with them, you see how magnificent and special they are. As a child, I grew up on the wild coast of South Africa where some of the most abundant sea life you could imagine came by my shores every year. 
My connection with sharks started when I was six. I went to the shark sport where they collect all the dead sharks out of the nets. And I remember walking through this freezer room piled with these magnificent blue sharks and mako sharks. Something inside my heart said, this is very wrong. I don't believe there's any animal on the planet that has ever been wiped out in such significant numbers as sharks have. Less than 10% of sharks are left. If we don't save them while we have big numbers, I don't believe that they'll be on this planet much longer. The smell of those dead animals and the, the loss of that life set me on a path that I would return to later in life, and that became a primary mission for me. I am a cinematographer, photographer, but more than anything, I'm a conservationist. If we don't take a stand and draw the line on these animals, nothing in the ocean is sacred. The sharks, this beautiful creature responsible for maintaining the balance and health of our oceans. Although sharks are probably safer than every other animal on the planet, that doesn't get into the news at all. We need to swim in that ocean and feel that water and see these animals grace our presence and realize that these are beautiful, magnificent, and sentient beings that were put on this earth long before us and that they play just as important role in the system, but they have a right to be here just like us. I believe the best thing that I can do for conservation is to connect people in a very profound way with sharks so that they can see their true nature as a majestic, sentient creature that you can easily fall in love with and therefore be compelled to spend the rest of your life fighting for the conservation of the species. Ecotourism is the fastest growing segment of the travel industry. And what once was a world where you went out and hunted animals for sport, we're now seeing a transition away for people to go out and they hunt with cameras and their eyes, and they leave the animals to grow and thrive. In South Africa, and unfortunately, there's a big lack of regulations on illegal fisheries here. Um, quantification of just how many prey species of white sharks are being removed, and we do believe that's happening in an alarming rate. You know, you've got a resource swimming along the coastline that a very poor family can feed, you know, themselves for over a, a month, let's say, or. And so, for example, in a restaurant in Cape Town, it would be very unlikely to see shark fin soup on a menu. Ethically, it's just disgusting. Alison, uh, take us through what we're about to experience here. Well, you're probably in one of the most remarkable locations in the world for marine life, as you're aware. And what's really special about this part that we're walking down to now in terms of a harbour is it's one of the most accessible locations on the planet for seeing great white sharks. The ecotourism, it's, you know, it's keeping this animal alive, and that's why we, yeah, we feel so strongly about it. For your safety, please take your seats and remain seated until we are anchor. Remember to keep one hand on the boat, the other hand for yourself. If you need any assistance, get the right out. Please draw the attention of any group. What we do on every single trip is have a qualified biologist on board to identify every single shark that comes around. <laughs> Which today is Which me. Is you. <laughs> and uh, what a yeah, what an yeah. amazing opportunity. So um, yeah, each grey white we see, we log down characteristics on it. We take photographs of the dorsal fin um, in order to be able to see if we can identify the animal. We have an extensive catalogue back on land um, with thousands and thousands of fin photos, so we can actually get a good gauge of who's visiting at what time of the year. And I think a lot of people don't realize how highly transient and migratory great whites are. There's a very high concentration of great whites here because there's a lot of food source for them here in this area, and they're losing that food source anywhere else, so they think, researchers think that that's why they're coming to these areas. And I think it's important for us to, to be their ambassadors spread the word of what's happening to them, because not everybody has the opportunity to come learn firsthand. White sharks having the protective legislation around them, you know, there are CITES Appendix 2 species, they're listed on CMS, so throughout their distribution they are 
you know, they're pretty much um, protected, but the, the problem is we get a lot of lack of enforcement. The cage diving, um, ecotourism was initiated in order to, you know, non-consumptively utilize the, the animal. Um, and it, it obviously provided its, um, its, its cause. It showed that um, it's a very viable um, outlet for tourism, for education, and for monitoring. Ecotourism is critically important because that is where people see, wow, this animal is actually a beautiful animal. See how it moves. It's not trying to jump on the boat. It's not trying to do this. It's never going to try and eat me. A live animal is worth a lot more than a dead animal. Why not uh, just enjoy looking at it and, and enjoy future generations to look at it? And um, we can all enjoy what's on the planet and leave something for somebody else coming along the way. When you're taking the life of an animal, you are directly affecting the world around you in a negative way. And the perpetuation of that negative effect is a ripple effect that you might not know how large and vast that ripple effect really is. We need to understand that our future and the future of the natural world are inextricably tied and that everything we are doing to hurt the oceans, hurting the nature, hurting the forest is going to hurt us. So that fundamentally comes from a connection that all species play a critical role in the thriving marine and terrestrial ecosystem. Elephants are juveniles, and so that means that, you know, they've been through the trauma of seeing their whole families and mothers poached. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hi. Every single one of these animals is here as a result of either human wildlife conflicts or poaching Greed, money. Or, or trophy hunting, whatever it may be that's left these poor orphans on their own. And it's, and, and it's wonderful and it's essential that this is happening, but what's just as important is that we prevent it from happening in the first place. Yeah. I'm Dan Richardson, I'm an actor and I'm an animal conservationist. And for as long as I can remember throughout my entire life, uh, love for animals, compassion towards animals has been uh, an inherent part of who I am and what matters to me. What what drives you? What is your why this? Our aim is to take them where to where they belong after giving them the second chance to survive. Wonderful. Wonderful. If I was not there, my all this could not have been here. You're right. Because no one to support them. But we also happy that. You guys also helping the part of it to support them, like me, I do on the ground. People right here in Kenya who dedicate their lives to this for very little reward. They're there to protect an animal that will never know they're there being protected. They, they will never know that that person was fighting the fight for them. If it was a, a war veteran coming home, they'd be, uh, they'd be awarded a medal for their bravery. These are frontline heroes doing this. To start with, uh, in number, I've got 11 baby elephants. I will start with Morera in front of us here, the poaching victim. The injury was caused by human error. They dug a hole and put some spike inside the, the hole. Morera stepped on, on this. That's why you see Morera is, is struggling to walk. If that happened with an elephant, would the poachers then also sell the ivory or just use the meat? No. Uh, those poachers who are just aiming for the bushmeat tree, they'll just look for the bushmeat, go for the, for the market. But if they were aiming the elephant for the ivory, they'll just take off the ivory and, and leave the carcass around there. This is called Kwanza. Kwanza is a poaching victim from Amboseli. She saw the mother being killed, plus one of the sisters. All this still with Kwanza's memory, and she's not very friendly even to human up to now. They can sense, they can, it's energy. So they can sense bad intention and good intention. 
if there's something bad around them, they'll be sensing and keeping away from that bad scent. And also they use smell to smell whatever is going around. For, the, for you to work with the, with the elephant, mostly elephants, you have to show them love. You don't force yourself. You know, with love, it's, not, it's something not forceful. Mm -hmm. So you have to and give them peace. So it's just peace and love. You'll be um, understanding each other. Well, I want to shake your hand. God bless you for oh, all you of me. your work. It's so important. <laughs> We're with you, and we uh, we want to save these animals as much as you. Thank you. you. I think you know elephants are an iconic species. Um, they represent Africa in so many ways. The orphans, especially, are such great ambassadors for the cause. I'm a pilot with the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. Even though we're raising money to protect elephants particularly, that money goes towards protecting their habitat and then all the animals that live in that habitat. So it's not just elephants that we're protecting ultimately. Find the poaching could be uh, shooting platforms. The poacher would build a platform on the top of the tree and then wait for animals to walk past, something the elephant and shoot them from above with poison arrows. It doesn't kill the elephant immediately. It can take several hours or even days to kill the elephant. So that poacher now has to track that elephant through the bush until they find it. So there's a chance of getting lucky and finding poachers we can catch them before they've killed the elephant. We're able to deploy canine units and rangers rapidly. That sort of enables identified to create a safe habitat for those elephants to be re-released into the wild. We started setting up these snaring teams which were protecting the area so that there was a, a safe habitat for the for elephants to go back to. Here is, is the main park. This is the best place to reintegrate them because we don't have uh, two roads here. Yeah. So um, they'll not be corrupted. Right. So here is where they will co be completely wild. They have their nice time to roam where they want to uh, yeah. browse. And, um, Eventually here, especially here in the water hole, is where they have a lot of interaction with the wild ones. This is Nelion coming in. Yeah. He's been a victim of poaching. Uh, we have uh, Aruba, who's uh, also a victim of uh, poaching. Um, they came in here when they completely given up. They had seen no life uh, um, in front of them, but now, they are settled. The keepers have given them that love. They feel that they are at home. Giving us uh, uh, that trust yeah. is yeah. a big thing for us. Of course. Because otherwise, um, big and heavy animals like this yeah. could smash you down in a minute. Because they play around, you see them happy again. Mm -hmm. um, the life that they had lost, has been given back mm -hmm. and um, they're happy to be with us. We raise them for 10 years until when they are really ready and confident to go out in the wild. You see, an animal that has gone wild, an ex-orphan that has gone wild, mm -hmm. and um, he gets a problem or he gets happiness in giving birth, he remembers you. That's the yeah, greatest yeah. thing. Anything that's found um, by a tourist or scout or KWS ranger is reported to KWS, and we work very closely with KWS, our veterinary team that we support. I've been able to save many animals which are uh, on the brink of death. A lot of uh, animals uh, shot uh, using guns, uh, arrows, and so forth. The biggest uh, challenge uh, in terms of conservation is, uh, is a poaching menace. The information should go to, uh, to the buyers and uh, the consumers of these products that they are doing more harm to the animals uh, than they think. If you protect the ecosystem, also you are protecting your own health. If you destroy the ecosystem, you're also destroying your own health. There's a real importance to protect what we do have left, and I think raising awareness of that is paramount.
So we are headed to the Care for Wild uh, Rhino Orphanage, the largest rhino orphanage in the world. And um, Petronel's uh, the founder, the owner. Uh, she's got an incredible team that helps her um, rescue, rehab, and, uh, and take in these baby rhinos uh, that we're about to see. These baby rhinos are sadly very valuable. Um, somebody um, cut the fence and they got in to the Solio Reserve. They were gonna kill some of the rhinos for the horns. And uh, the anti-poaching units found the guy, and thank God they shot the poacher before he can shoot uh, one of these rhinos, which, as we know, there's not many left. Poaching rhino horn is the third biggest revenue generator of any criminal enterprise in the world. It goes all the way to the demand, this ridiculous myth in the Far East, that a material the same as hair and fingernails can have magical healing properties. So wildlife crime isn't a group of specialists, it's the same people who are trafficking narcotics. They're using the same routes, they're using the same middlemen, the same corrupt customs officials. It's now moved recently, in the case of rhino horn, from health to wealth. So where the medicinal properties of rhino horn were shown to be nonsense, it's moved from that to a status symbol. And that's a really, really difficult idea to eradicate. Rhinos are going to be on the brink of extinction if we don't have more facilities like this, um, more petronols to uh, literally dedicate their lives to saving these animals. There's petronol, I think. I think so. I think that's her. Oh my god. Hi, hi, how are you? Got completely hi. lost. It's just in love. That's a good, a yes, good principle. Yes. You are obviously their voice, but you are reversing all of the damage that has been done to these animals as a result of greed and money and evil. Black rhino plus minus 4,000 in the world. That's it. That's it. That, There's that only 4,000 4, black rhino. That's it. The day they phone and say, we're going to intervene and we need to make sure that we save rhinos. And I say, God, please help me to serve where this animal is coming from with everything I've got. So this is Baby Summer. I've heard a lot about her. I've seen a lot of videos. And uh, so tell me, how did you find her? Baby Summer came to us from uh, Arian Kruger National Park. They were out patrolling. And then they um, found her next to her mom. And her mom was already dead. And uh, horns hacks off her face. And she was lying uh, next to her mom. And then they call in the, the rest of the rangers and the helicopter and the pilots and the veterinarian. And then they darted her, put her in the helicopter and uh, bring her to us. Every time a baby comes, it's an anxiety. They will put that baby in the helicopter. Bouchers is shooting at the pilot. I truly believe and I trust that, that at that stage, if I'm the one that needs to protect this animal, the rest must fall in place. In the beginning, they don't realize mom is gone. Though. They cry and they call. So you have to understand the language okay. and the comfort that you need to do. And so at first, it's a trust. Look at that. Like Look at that. <gasps> Katie. Look at the face. Is this a face? Hi. Look at the mouth. So you these are the these mouth. are the. This is you hold oh, I'm holding this one. Okay. Oh my gosh. That these are the black the, rhinos. Yeah, this is black. The, I love to create the emotional bond between an animal and a person that looks after the animal because you cannot look after something if you don't love it. Mm. I live very near these animals. We love them. Yeah. And and. The healing powers is in the animal. These are the ones that are going to be released. Okay. How many? They're the next group that needs to uh, needs to be released. These are white rhinos. Uh, also white rhinos. They just came in from the felt. We call it a boma, but it's all uh, it's actually a holding facility. I see. It's a temporary or uh, 
permanent holding facility. So if you look at your poles, you can clearly see there's some areas where you can go see through and so on, and it's planted and it makes your animal safe, but it's also an area for you to be safe as the person that's working with them. This is very serious. This isn't just, like you said, you know, running a farm with some rhinos. This is saving the last of a species that the rest of the world may not see. The purpose of this exercise is to help the dog for anti-poaching. I'm a retired police officer, especially the canine unit. My passion now at this stage is definitely the rhinos, because you hear them at night, especially these youngsters. They miss the, the family, because they're orphans now. And there's a female that adopted them, uh, take care of them, and the one was very weak, and all of a sudden, take him under her uh, wing, start eating and start functioning normal. You see this every day for seven months, then you start realizing you can make a difference. And protect our rhinos. If you leave this rhinos, just an example, in two days there's no rhinos here. Because the word's gonna spread. That's why we do the inside and the outside perimeter to see if there's any movement or there's people that can uh, sitting and watching us. So they cut the horn, the next morning it's gone. The rhino horn is for the east, eastern block. All of them go there. When you first see a rhino that's been poached, then you decide. That guy don't need to walk free. He's gonna hunt you down. The jungle land teaches observation and awareness. Is this uh, target worthy of killing or not? Is it a friendly or whatever? So the whole thing is uh, designed to build that process um, and to ingrain it in a ranger or anti-poaching operator. My own satisfaction is just to look after them and protect them and help the owner sleep safe and feel that they're safe, that we can make a difference. Policing is as much a fundamental part of the a holistic conservation approach as education in an African school. And as long as we all fight together and we are shining a light on these issues and changing them, we can win. And, uh, and that's absolutely crucial that we do so. tragic. I can't explain the feeling. How meaningful is this place to you and the, your colleagues, the team that work here? On the one hand, it's a testament to all the work we do. Sure, these are animals that have been poached. You know, our populations are growing. And it's quite a, it's a, it's a, it's a great place for us to come and just remember, you know, that this is what is taken. Because sometimes you forget. And it's particularly sad now because of Sudan. You know, he's the last male northern one I know on the planet, and there he is. What he did more powerfully than anything else I've ever seen was underline the damage we've done. He, he emphasized the damage we've done as a species to his species and others. It's the sixth extinction, the whole scene extinction, means extinction based on human impact, and it's happening now. Some people don't believe it's happening, but we can clearly see it happening with Sudan and all the, the negative human impact uh, based on um, greed, money, um, the legal Myth. black market trade of this, this species for something that has no real medicinal purpose. Animal conservation is my purpose in life, and without it, animals like these, and incredibly we're talking about the last two of a species in this case, that um, I want to stand up and fight for. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to comprehend, isn't it? We're literally looking the last. at the two last existing individuals of, a, of an entire species. It's shocking. Because of human destruction, look at the research now. Only the two remaining on the planet. 
Do you think that in vitro fertilization will work with um, possibly the, the southern female white rhino right here, the surrogate? Yeah, we still had hope uh, because um, in vitro fertilization has never been done before. So we are waiting to see how it's going to be done and we hope that it might help. If it really helps, um, we can still have a chance to have as many rhinos as we can. In getting the eggs out, fertilizing the eggs, creating embryos, um, is one part of the problem that has to be solved. The next part is going to be re-implanting those northern white rhino embryos back into surrogate southern white rhino females because the two living northern whites can't carry a calf, can't get pregnant. I think for the most part people need to fight battles close to home. So um, whether it's legislation or pressuring politicians in their local area to protect, you know, maintain the integrity of protected areas. I actually consider this capital, this state capital of California, the epicenter of progress in this country. And frankly, I think it's a, it's a fulcrum where we can put a lever and actually start to change global economics around uh, this uh, brutal trade uh, that is on the verge of extincting some of our most iconic species on the planet. Trophy hunting for these iconic, endangered African species is not only brutal, but it is anachronistic, some false show of masculinity that people want to go out there and act tough by slaughtering lions, rhinos, giraffes. This has to end. This bill, SB 1487, could actually preserve the last remaining iconic endangered species on this planet. A fight for our own humanity is wrapped up in the future of these species. Even though you say, well, what does this have to do with people? You're not helping people here. I say that this is the most powerful thing we can do to restore the dignity and humanity of the human race and not just make ourselves exploiters and consumers, but stewards. We're putting our flag down here in California today saying we know where we stand. We stand with the species of this planet and that the ultimate test of a civilization's morality is how they treat those who can't protect themselves. Do you like to fight? And do you like to fight with ethics and the law on your side? And that's why I'm here. I'm a nice guy, but I don't like to be pushed around. I don't like bullies. We have firsthand experience uh, witnessing um, the two last female northern white rhinos left on the planet. Lions, cheetahs, Elephants, uh, all of these species are facing extinction, and we support this bill 100%, and we ask for your support to save these animals before they go extinct uh, in our lifetime. Thank you so much. They've been on this planet for millions of years, and in the last 120 years, we've been wiping them out. A dead elephant is one hunting fee to usually a dictator. It never gets to the people. Trophy hunting is the worst. It's strictly to, you know, to see who's got the biggest elephant head or whatever they're, well, they're looking for. I feel humans should know better. If you ever get down to a point where you've lost all of your wild populations, you only have animals left which have been kept in zoo conditions for long periods, then your chances of recovering that species are going to be extremely small. We have the power to reverse it, and it needs to be led by governments. And I think we're beginning to see that happen. If we can change rules, regulations, government, laws, the way that um, the fishing quotas to this, to that, then we should do it. SB 1487 could actually be what turns the tide in the fight to preserve the, the last remaining iconic endangered African species. SB 1487 does that by prohibiting the possession of body parts of 11 iconic African endangered species. Conservation strategy need not adopt a policy of poaching and of killing to actually achieve its ends. How do we want to be remembered on this planet as people? those who left nothing else behind and just were extracting this planet and vanquishing species and torturing animals. The motion is to pass to the Committee on Judiciary. Eduardo Garcia. Aye. 
Garcia I. Gallagher. No. Carrillo. Aye. Carrillo I. Or that actually healed this planet, and I think right now is that moment. The bill is out, eight to four. In the entertainment business, I'm always getting makeup on my face. And I want to make sure that the animals didn't suffer unnecessarily. That, to me, is the, the most cruel. Science has evolved past bunnies in a box. So now that we have these human-relevant models that are actually closer to keeping humans safe, more efficient and cheaper, we can use them. I just want to say how proud I am to be a principal co-author of SB 1249 to protect animals from cosmetic testing. And look, we know that for more than 50 years, unfortunately, um, animals have been used in painful tests uh, to assess the safety of chemicals used in cosmetic products. Not only is this practice inhumane, but unnecessary where lab alternatives exist. Please join me in supporting SB 1249, such an important legislation uh, for those that do not have a voice to speak up for themselves. Thank you so much for being here. Today is uh, critically important to save the lives of hundreds of thousands of animals every year that get tortured for vanity and fashion. And I always strive to ask everybody to go cruelty free and always look for the leaping bunny. And if it does not say cruelty free, they usually test on animals. As an actress, every makeup chair that I sit in, I try to make sure that the cosmetics being used on me were not tested on animals. But the burden is on us. It is on the consumer. And it shouldn't be that way. And it isn't that way in the EU and many other countries. After getting resounding bipartisan support in the Senate with Democrats and Republicans coming together to vote in favor of it, SB 1249 now faces an important vote on the assembly floor. You know, what are, what are we doing? What, it's completely archaic. Um, it's, it's fiscally irresponsible. We have the numbers on that as well. So it would be great if California, as progressive as it is, would be the first to do this. In very privileged countries like the United States, we tend to be very centered on self. All of the things that involve cruelty and chemicals and everything else they're putting in your cosmetics is bad for you. So if you're centered on self, you want to make better decisions for your body, your health, the environment, the planet that you're leaving for your children, these are the decisions. They still allow testing to occur in China, so SB 1249 would get rid of that exemption, so even if you were to test it in China, you wouldn't be able to sell it in California, which is a huge step forward. Once they introduce the bill, then I have to, and my team, we have to knock on every office, every legislator's office, talk to them about the bill, tell them why it's important, and get them to vote for it. One of the reasons why we asked John to come today is because he is an entrepreneur, and since his uh, stardom as a basketball player, he's embraced a vegan lifestyle, compassion, entrepreneur. So he's really um, a star to us in, in this realm, and we're so honored to have him with us today. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, let me ask you, have you heard anything about SB 1249 yet, the California Cruelty-Free Cosmetics Act? Because the, the existing testing is still killing and torturing over 400,000 animals well, a year. We've done a lot of things in the past because we didn't know better, um, but now we do. Uh, when they asked, they yeah. said, don't you want to go up on a hill, man? And shake some fences and get some people to pay attention. I just think it's a it's a cool thing. And, it's, and if I could go and see things in sports that's not gonna change anybody's life, mm -hmm. right? And guys will sit around and they argue on ESPN all day about it. Mm -hmm. This changes not just our lives. It means we save like 54 million land animals a year, everybody. And another thing, you make sure <laughs> you get that vote. Did you, oh, you hear him? We're rolling on that, right? <laughs> With advocates like this, I'm very pleased to sign on as a co-sponsor of this legislation and looking forward to working with the group. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
doesn't I understand you're a, you're a vegan, right? Yeah. My, bro my brother my brother does, M it's like, a, he had for a while was doing like MMA fighting, like he was big and all that, and he's a vegan too. He was the one who told me that. When I first came in Elite, my first year, I was eating a cheeseburger and, and fries and a shake before playing against Milwaukee Bucks, and I'm still knocked out, and I was the slowest I ever was. And he said, how's that cheeseburger treating you? And then from that point on, from 1986, I started paying attention to what food does. Um, Oprah put out a thing with Dupac uh, Chopra in 1993. It was, you should not eat with people you don't like because your body, your psyche, does certain things to the food. So if you eat something that's dead, something that has been murdered, something that has been afraid to be murdered, and you get that in your spirit, you now have that. You ever see the biggest guys are always jumpy? That's the cow. <laughs> are you an I vote? I'm totally against animal testing too. So, and I have been throughout my career. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> my friend started a thing called Mixed Chicks for hair. She's half white, half black, and her hair was mixed, so she had it for, for hair. And she literally made it cruelty-free before she put it out. And if she can do that in the thought process, and they asked me to come be involved, I said, yeah, no problem. Uh, I am an animal lover. Yay! So, so I am an, I can commit to that, that I'm an animal <laughs> lover. Uh, so so I am, I, I'm all about uh, being humane and humanity and making sure that we do things right. And so I find that interesting. It would be a great way to be able to go back and find some data and some pathway so that we can help guide the committee in making the right decision. Can I have a picture so just in case you do it wrong, no, it I can say this? Yeah. Yeah. I have a picture. <laughs>
We're involved with protecting the environment, protecting animals. That's what we do, okay? The meat industry is the greatest negative impact against both of those things. Being a vegan, it really helps a lot because I know the importance of the things which I'm protecting. One less step to being able to fight. Uh, there's two types of conservationists. Uh, there's vegans and there's those that don't like to take their work home. And I'm happy to say that, and that's cost of a, lo a lot of funding, but the truth isn't for sale and it never will be. Living that plant-based lifestyle, the first thing that I cut out was dairy. The leading cause of environmental pollution. And I also knew that these cows were enslaved. Uh, listen, a cow has to give birth to give milk. So there are some dairies that are pumping out hundreds of calves per day. A lot of those calves are male. And where do those calves go now? Because there isn't a monster veal industry anymore, those calves are going for dog food. My name is Kudo. I'm the founder and lead investigator of ARM Animal Recovery Mission. We're based in Miami Beach, Florida. What we're doing in the field, rescuing animals, delivering undercover footage, exposing really the truth of the worst cases of animal cruelty, It is a extremely sad, heartbreaking job to look at animals while you're in the field undercover and see them boiled alive, butchered alive, disassembled alive, beaten to death. And remember, as an undercover investigator, you're the bad guy. So you have to um, laugh and, and be one of the crowd as this is taking place. This is a small percentage of our gear. Um, you know, the drone. Okay. Extremely important to the investigator. Undercover camera. Without the undercover camera, we would get absolutely nothing done and absolutely no footage whatsoever. People in, that are working in slaughterhouses and factory farm, they have violent, violent pasts. Um, they have been convicted of serious crimes in the past. But also, we're undercover right now in farms that um, hard narcotics are being used and dealt. You know, it's important for people to understand the true reality of what's take, what takes place in, in factory farms, where you think you're getting your meat from a, a good, wholesome place, and it's actually coming from a place that's dirty, uh, inhumane, and just un, uncared for. We just arrived at this uh, hunting preserve in Florida, and um, so tell me about this this place. Uh, there's several several locations here in uh, Central Florida that provide people the opportunity to come out here and pay to hunt several different types of species of animals and uh, endangered species that are raised here on these properties, and then people pay large amounts of money, up to twenty, thirty thousand dollars, to come out here and uh, and hunt. People don't really even know that that this is even available. And to be honest, I didn't even know that this was available wow. until recently. You can feel there's like some kind of, there's a fear. Anybody who says that they care for their animals and that uh, their, their animals are happy, they're not happy. Animals that are free are happy. The animals that are contained and enslaved are not happy. These people, I think that they feel like they're not doing anything wrong, and they feel like, you know, this is a way for them to profit and make money off of killing animals. There's something wrong with yeah. people that can feel okay with killing an animal and then putting a trophy on their, their wall yeah. or a rug yeah. on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, it, 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 I mean, it just doesn't really make sense. So the only saving of the animal that takes place is, is, by, is by us. Um, 
the outside world is the one who needs to to come in and, and save those animals. And you know, you say, oh, I, I'm not, I can't go in there and do those investigations, which I've met plenty of people who have who have said that that they can't go in there. I can't believe you do that, or I can't, you know, I, I could never do what you do. But the reality is, is that those those individuals they can help, and they can help in a in a drastic way just by not consuming that product. Who's <laughs> this? Yeah, this is the one. Mm -hmm. The one and only. So this is Secretariat's great, great grandson. Great grandson. Basically, oh yeah. my gosh! Yeah. Wow. So he has a really so interesting story, though. Um, he's the whole reason why I'm started. Basically, uh, as a three-year-old, he was in one of his few races. He hadn't started much, and uh, as you can see on his leg, he's got uh, fire pin marks. So he got clipped by another horse, which pretty much shattered his like leg, like almost broke it all. And then they decided he had no use, so they took him to a slaughter farm, and that's where he was going to become a part of the black market horse meat trade. Unbelievable. And that's when Kudo first found out about the black market horse meat trade, and as a redemption to freedoms, was like, I'm going to expose it and bust it and then get back to my life. Well, we found, he soon found out that uh, illegal animal slaughter farms is like the you know, the underground belly where everything, all of the illegal and horrible animal cruelty operations just, you know, network out of. So everything wow. from animal fighting and, yeah. Started with rescuing a horse from an illegal slaughterhouse in Miami, Florida. But that is really what made me break out of my bubble. It's what, it's what made me give up my profitable life, monetarily, to switch and make the leap. And I can tell you from a person who was so profit driven that I'm much more happy and accomplished in my life now than I was then. And that's little Kudo. That's one of the first pigs at the back. He, Kudo actually rescued him off in the middle of the night off a slaughter farm in Miami. And he actually had an ax hole in his top of his head. <gasps> he still has it. He has a scar. No. So Kudo took him in. He's very cool, very quiet and calm. When you meet farm animals in the sanctuary setting, you start to see how they are all very different. You know, like each pig is so different in their likes and dislikes and the way they behave and interact with people. And so I think, you know, it's just a misconception that has, is put out there for a reason because we couldn't possibly eat them if we knew them. Calvin with the white stripe is, uh, his mother died giving birth to him, so he's been here with us. Brownie, the big one with the horns, he's one of the few um, owner relinquishments that we took. And then we'll see who else comes over. But do they like probably all. Here in the States, we don't eat dogs, we don't eat cats, you know, and we've put up this wall in between them and all of the other animals. If you come out to a sanctuary and you meet these guys and you look them in the eyes, you'll see that they're not different than your dog, they're not different than your cat. Just like you wouldn't eat a dog, you're not gonna eat a pig once you make that connection. <laughs> a lot of different farm animals have the awareness, the intelligence, the emotional intelligence of a three-year-old child. It's a critical thing to understand this dichotomy of ingesting the very thing that we would care for in any other situation. <laughs> yeah. My name is David Verberg. I'm a 2016 Olympic gold medalist plant-based athlete and animal advocate. Basically, the whole reason why I became vegan was because I grew up on a, a farm with probably 25 different types of animals, from chickens to goats, sheep, peacocks. Somebody came up to me, and we were talking, and I had, the, I had you know, a bottle fed the calf, and they're like, well, so you must be vegan. And I was like, no. You know, well, like, why not? And I didn't have a good answer at the time. Like, I really couldn't tell them why I wasn't vegan. And then that's when I slowly started my transition to a full plant-based lifestyle. It went with steak first and chicken and then fish and then kind of just slowly, slowly, slowly started cutting out dairy from my diet. And people look at me like, he's running a little bit better. He's smiling, he's happy, he has energy. Like, what is, what is he doing? And then that's when I'm like, oh, well, you know, I switched to a plant-based diet. And that's when the questions start like, okay, well, how? What did you do? And that's when it's like, oh, well, let me show you. And that's when you kind of like take them by the hand and you kind of help in that direction. When you want people to make changes, significant changes in their diet, that's a huge thing for them, you know what I mean? And it's terrifying. We do monthly vegan potlucks. Yeah. Um, 
you know. Got all kinds of things going yeah. on, so. When you have great alternatives like the Beyond Burger, I think it helps like lessen that fear. I am a, a junk food vegan. I eat vegan macaroni and cheese and vegan cheeseburgers and vegan burritos and vegan pizza and all of those things that other people eat. I'm just eating vegan versions of it. And so I don't care if you're doing it for your health or the environment or the animals. At the end of the day, the animals benefit from us making that decision. I've got a 200 mile an hour billboard promoting the vegan diet. When you've got 7.6 billion people on the planet making day-to-day -day decisions, you know, we need to be making conscious ones or we're gonna not only destroy the planet and our environment, we're gonna take out humanity, but we're gonna take out so many amazing species with us. And three times a day, we all sit down for a meal and it doesn't cost extra money to leave meat and dairy products off of your plate. In fact, it will save you money in healthcare because you're gonna be healthier. I can go to the store right now and pick up, you know, a variety of different kinds of vegan ice creams and vegan macaroni and cheeses and vegan pizzas. And so this excuse that it's a hard thing to do, I just, I don't buy it. <laughs>
Um, not only did the sandwich have cheese, but I can tell it had meat and they had just taken the meat off. I told them I'm sorry and I was very polite. Give it back to them. They sent me chicken broth next. Told them chicken broth is not vegan. They said, well, there's no chicken in the soup. Um, and <laughs> at the end of this ordeal, I was told by the hospital administrator, and I quote, we don't give vegan meals. People who want vegan just cave in and they eat what I get, what we give them. We're not a fringe thing. We're not crazy. It's, this is just a compassionate lifestyle is all, is all it is. And I think when you put it towards people that way, I can't really argue with doing less harm. Item number nine, SB 1138, do pass as amended to appropriations. Call the members, please. Hernandez. Aye. Hernandez, aye. Leva. Mitchell. Monning. Aye. Nielsen. Aye. Pan. Aye. Currently at six, enough to get out. We're going to place that bill and call. We do have some absent members. You know, I suppose the most enlightening thing or empowering thing for me is, is the realisation the important things in life are not things, they're actions. Uh, and deciding that my life is not going to be about me anymore and what I can make and take, but what about uh, what I can do. Being able to speak out on behalf of animals, being able to be a, a voice for the voiceless. Uh, and knowing that you, we maybe can't change the entire world as an individual, but we can change the world for many individuals. Mother Nature, that feminine energy needs to rise again because it is only that energy, I believe, that will give us space to let other beings share this world with us. And that's where we need to turn the tide and support an ecosystem that not only thrives for nature, but itself helps protect our livelihoods and our future. The more people that just spend time in nature, I, I think it's, it's a, a win for themselves, spiritually, personally, and on a global level, it's people really need to slow down and, and think about what we're doing and how we're coexisting with this amazing planet. We have to place more value on life, and I think that goes with all animals. I think there's more people that are uh, getting interested in uh, the well-being of animals. And I think it's just general intelligence. Mankind is tough on the planet. Changing the way of looking at animals is saving the planet.